Hey everybody, and welcome back to The Overlay, a poker podcast brought to you by CCG Poker Radio. We're going to get the advertising bits out of the way right now. Brandon, do you want to... Brandon's with us again from uh, quarantine. Here I am. Just quarantining away. Quarantining away. I mean, Indiana's starting to open up a little bit more, so you can like go outside now. Must be nice. And I can, yeah. Parks are open. Restaurants are open. 50% Ooh. capacity. Everything non-essentials open. Um, I mean, it's everything. Honestly, everything's open. It's a zoo. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, right? I don't want to get into down the COVID right, right, right. Or the, but I mean, it's it's like Christmas time every day out there. You go out there and it's like Menards, Target, Walmart, every single place. It's like people are shopping at Christmas time. We'll do a quick Which, like under two minute COVID deal. We're already into a minute because it's the middle of May, twenty twenty. Um, Indiana's open. Times. Illinois is closed. Uh, are, yes. Do you see a ton of people in masks, or what's what's the take on that? Honestly, it's about I would say it's it's sixty forty seventy thirty masks. Okay, so a lot of masks. I mean, it's the majority of masks, and if people aren't wearing a mask when they're walking into Target, they have them in their hands. You know, there's it's it's it's, it's a decent it's amount. Pretty of masks. prevalent. Yeah. All right. That's and good. obviously, still tons of social distancing going on. I mean, if you're in Target and there's a ten person line, you're sixty feet back. Right. You know, and, and they're wiping down the counter. Which I actually, every one. that might be one thing that I'm willing to keep. I think there should be lines at the supermarket because there are many times when I turn around and look at people like, hey, buddy, back up. Like, what are you breathing down my neck for? Back up. Like, we're not getting any closer. You're not putting anything on the, the beltway here. Like, move back. Like, why do people want to stand so close? I get a very personal space issues with people. Yeah, getting... I think pers- the personal space bubble has definitely expanded. Even when there's no more COVID, right? In whatever year this great. thing's all over with, which is great. I'm. That's the one benefit from this. I can't imagine there are many others, but that's one. Um, all right. So Emissions. let's. We, we said we were going to mention the sponsors. So yes. um, Paramount Social out in Houston, Texas. If you're listening to us from Texas, thank you for listening. Texas is also open, uh, which means Paramount opens up tomorrow, which will be five twenty twenty uh, for seven o'clock. They're doing a five hundred dollar free roll. Uh, which they always do on Wednesday nights. And uh, yeah, if you're listening, check it out. But they're going to be back open to their regular schedule Wednesday through Sunday, cash games and tournaments, albeit six-handed and lots of cleaning and sanitizing. And I think uh, it's Texas, so I don't think uh, they're mandatory masks, although they are strongly encouraged. But yeah. I don't think they're forcing, I don't think you can force anybody down there, but that's another no. story. Right. Um, and then CCG Poker is uh, planning. I've been talking to a few peeps since I have the inside scoop on what that's going to happen. Uh, we're looking at like end of June, beginning of July, whenever phase four hits in Illinois, which uh, we're supposed to hit phase three here on mm, the 28th of May, right? Yep. And then the 24th is the next scheduled phase jump. It's so weird to say phase 24th jump. Of June. Yeah, 24th of June would be phase four, which would be 50 person gatherings. So the plan going forward for CCG, um, because our predominant, I think, audience is here in Chicago. Um, We're going to be doing 50 person smaller events, six handed tables, lots of cash games, some less less tournaments because it's just with 50 people, it's going to be hard to do a 50 person because a 50 person early bird is normally kind of a slower bird. Right. 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 So we're just going to kind of see how tournaments go, maybe one or two scheduled tournaments, maybe some more sit-and-goes. We might see COVID-19 bring back the the rebirth of the sit-and-go, Yep, which would be kind of cool. I agree with that. Because when you get less players at the table and you get less people in the tournament, you naturally want to raise the buy-in of the tournament to make right. it worth it, and then which case kind of forms a you know 12-person, two-table sit-and-go. Correct. And, you know, you can you can slap one hundred and twenty dollars in there and, you know, one hundred dollars goes to the price pool. All of a sudden you got twelve hundred dollars. You're playing for 12 people. Correct. You know, boom, bang, boom, four hours and somebody wins seven hundred bucks, which is kind of it's a very everything. small deep stack. But I mean, again, that it's again, we have to take what we can do and we're going to have to get used to shorthanded play, which I'm getting better at my segues. This uh-huh. is going to move us into episode now. 12. Uh, so thank you to CCG Poker and Paramount for continually sponsoring the podcast, even though live poker is currently, up until tomorrow, not a thing in the United States. It's, it's good to see it back, though. I'm so happy about live poker. I'm just so tired of people asking about online. It's just it's so... 
I just I don't like online poker. I've I've never been a big fan. I just I love playing in person. There's just something about getting up, going. It's like golf. You can't play golf in a screen and call it golf. Right. It's not. It's, like, it's a video game. Like Golden Tee is not golf. No. Even when you're swinging into a simulator, it's still very much not a real, real go- game. Right. You got to right. be outside. If I'm at a, I need to feel the 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 smell the of smoke and the, and the guy yeah. next to me, you know, reeks of skunk. And uh, you know, you got your Todds of the world ordering triple jacks and coke, which very little coke is in there. Um, but that's fine. That's what they want to do. WSB bringing in his, you know, McDonald's cup, hanging out with that. <laughs> Jack, yeah, Jack and diet. Jack and diet. I'm a, you know, I'm a Jack fan. I'm a Jack Daniels fan. Yeah, Jack drink, and Diet's it's smooth. Jack and Diet is my is my go to like 100 percent drink. Unless I'm at like a fancy place where you get like a muddled blood orange something whatever costs yeah. me fifteen dollars just to $15 be fifteen cool. dollar drink for right. a half a shot. I yeah. would rather have my three dollar well Jack and Diet and be very happy. So yeah, you know, I've I really quick, you know, there's like there's some doom and gloomers that I've been talking to. They're like, oh, live poker's dead forever. I'm like, come on, guys, like let's not. Like live poker's not dead forever. It's already back in Texas and rolling six handed. Right. Oh, it'll never be the same. Cool. It might never be exactly the same. Correct. But live poker is definitely. It's not going to die. It's not going to. Right. Not two thousand twenty four. To... It's going to be here. The World Series poker is going to be running with thousands of people. Like I don't want to hear that at some point. Dead. Yep. It's going to happen. Come on. It has come to happen. Yeah. Um. So again, our segue, which kind of got derailed. That's fine. Episode 12. Under, it. Yeah. Uh, episode 12, uh, we're going to discuss final table play, shorthanded play, and ICM. Kind of what is ICM? Because you were always telling me about ICM, and I never fully grasp all of it because I'm not a huge tournament player, and I don't 100%. So we're going to go over all of that stuff. Um, and I think it's very important right now because live play, uh, live playker, live poker as we know it is going to be shorthanded games like it's just going to be what it is and six-handed is really like an optimal optimal number Six, seven is really the juicy number so we're one off from like the absolute nut nut poker game is a seven-handed game yes correct i 100 percent agree you're right the Nine action moves 10. faster it's just yes. it's a it's a better game Yep, because you get five people, and now all of a sudden it's fold, fold, and you got to raise every single button, and you're playing blind versus blind, a lot of heads up, fast, a little bit like if people aren't opening up and playing, it's a little boring. And if you get to ten or nine handed, it's just fold, fold, fold. You can sit around and wait for queens plus, yeah, ace king tightens up, and then now you get seven, and now it's like the perfect range of like, and there's you know all the positions, early position kind of turns into middle position, and you know there's a lot more stealing going on and three betting and. People just seem to open up a lot more around that seven-handed mark, where it's honestly it's the most fun to play. It is because you you know you can you can you get wide to play your range a little bit, but it's not like four-handed where it's like oh it's on me every hand. Gosh, I have eight dudes suited. I have to play here. You know, it's it's a nice little middle ground where it's it's good. It's good poker seven-handed. So six-handed is pretty close. Yeah, it's definitely. Um... But it's definitely different than the nine and ten handed that people are used to. Well, let's hop right into where it. You, yeah, it's kind of where you start changing gears. And again, where this all comes from is that the last episode, episode eleven, which was uh, how to exploit players on the money bubble, we talked about you know how the play is different when the money bubble is about to burst, right? And then right. this is talking about. We're already into the money. We're kind of going with the tournament mindset here because it's definitely ICM doesn't really have any kind of uh, you know play in a cash game, so. You know, we're talking about final table play. Most final tables are going to start 10 handed and then they're eventually they got to work all the way down until your head's up. And so many players, I feel like right now um, and just in general, poker players do not want to play shorthanded play. And you have to play shorthanded in order to win a tournament because they're they're uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable. And there's all these new spots that you've played hundreds of thousands of hands nine handed but you haven't played very many hands five-handed or four-handed because you only get to play four-handed when you're down to the final four of the tournament, which I don't care how good you are. It doesn't happen too very often. Right. You know? Everybody's experience level goes down as you get less and less players because of the fact that, again, you're used to playing full ring games or full tournaments and you know even like a normal it's it's funny because like when you play in a poker tournament and like you lose a player the guy hasn't even gotten up the board's not even off the the table yet and you got four other guys at the table yelling we're down to seven we're down to seven players we got seven players left floor Uh and i'm like guys one 
give the man a second or lady, you know, not to be sexist here. Give the person who just got busted out of the tournament, their tournament dreams are down the drain. Give them a second to collect their thoughts and move on. We haven't even cleared the board yet. Like they're still making sure they didn't find some secret straight that they missed or a four flush or something like give them a second. And again, it's not like online where all of a sudden, boop, the tables just magically populate. And that, I, that's my favorite line when they're like, final table, final table. Like, guys, this isn't the internet. Like, I can't just go, boop, 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 and we're dealing at the final table. Right. Yeah. Like, like that you doesn't give racks, happen. You got to, you got to give seat cards. People got to move. They got drinks. They got food. And, and every, you know, everyone's got to move all their chips. I and mean, our first rules question when you're in the WSOP and you move from four tables down to three, do they pause the clock for that table move when you're breaking the table down? No. No, the clock never stops. It's a clock. There's a clock for a reason, because that's it's another just, thing that it's happens. An understood a lot. part of the term. Like we don't get to stop the clock when we're combining a table. No. Like I understand it takes two minutes, but like a decision takes two minutes, and we don't stop the clock. Correct. You know, it's like it's part of the game that tables break all the time, and the clock is just continuous. Could you imagine pausing the clock every time we broke a table in a big, a hundred person tournament? I mean, it's it's ridiculous. The time lost would be an, an incredible amount. It would make. And I mean, sometimes people got to go from table ninety nine to table two and walk all the way across the room. And like, I get it. It takes some time, but like, you cannot just pause the clock. That's no. it's just it is what it is. You have to play through it. It's one of the tournament things that you have to do. So let's jump into final table play. Um, so we're in the money. There are. What do we want to start? We want to start with six players left. Um. Where do yeah, you? Want? Let's start with. Well, let's start with. A four. Um. Yeah. No, no, six players left, and we'll just say they're all already deep in the money. Like, we paid 12. Okay. Let's just say we paid 12, 120-person tournament. We paid 10%, 12, and we're down to the final six. So this is our this is our scenario that we're drawing up. Nice. So where do you want to start? First of all, I like to, when you get to a final table, it's kind of weird because you kind of have this feeling where you want to feel out how it goes because some fi- final tables are not all created equal, right? I mean, okay. there's some final tables that feel so much different than other final tables, and it really all depends on, like, the chip stacks and who has the chips. Because, like, there's some times where you get to a final table and there's just an absolute dominant chip leader. He's defined. He has half the chips in play with 10 people left. Average stack only has, obviously, 10% of the chips, if I'm doing my math right. So he has five times average. That, that final table is going to play way differently than the final table that has 3 million in chips, 2.8 million, 2.5 million, Two million, one point, you know, where the chip distribution is much, is much less. Yeah, right. So I think that early on in final tables, and now we're fast forwarding to six max. We're down to the final six, but people really tend to feel it out. People are really kind of playing tight, especially now that we're already in the money. Every single jump is a money bubble, which is where we came up with the episode to do this ICM pressure. Correct. And I, I don't know if you want to just jump, jump right into ICM because I mean. This whole episode kind of bases around. Yeah, you're running the show here because you're the expert on uh, wow. on ICM. So run with it. Um, so ICM independent chip model module model. I'm going to go with model is basically like a formula that turns your amount of chips into a dollar value. So it basically does the quick math and it turns the percentage of chips you have and the percentage of the prize pool your chips are worth. Because, I mean, you get to a final table, and then if we paid 12 and we're down to, you know, six, there's still, what, 60%, 70% of the prize pool off the The lion's grabs. share is left, yeah. I mean, every most of it is left still. So, I mean, you have to take your chips now, and now they are worth a dollar amount, and you don't want to spend those chips um, in a poor decision-making dis- uh What am I looking for here? Like, you don't want to spend those chips poorly because that can end up costing you real dollars at the end of the day. Um, so independent chip model is basically saying a chip earned isn't as much as a chip loss is basically the easiest way I would say it. If you can have a chance to double your stack or be out, like you don't want to take that risk unless you have to, even if your hand is slightly superior, like I wouldn't take a 60, 40. Well, let's give it like a, like an actual real world scenario, meaning if yeah, there's guess, six yeah. players left in the tournament and yeah. the third and fourth chip stacks of, you know, the middle of the pack, the two middle pack guys, if right. you're in a Queens versus ace King scenario, the classic flip 50, 50, and it doesn't matter. You're just talking about a flip. If you're, if you've got either way Kings or, you know, if you've got the pair or the ace King, 
the ICM starts to think about things where is it worth me doing this coin flip at this stage in the tournament, even though I'm getting correct odds, it's 50-50, because the problem is the, the people who are at fifth and sixth in chips have far less chips than you do. You don't want to get knocked out in sixth place because your chips are worth more at that current time than the actual but, pot would be worth if you won it. Correct. So that's, that's yeah, I was just going to get, I was even going to say, even a 60-40, even if you have king-queen and the guy shows king-jack, like, depending on the chip counts, if there's fifth and sixth place that are bleeding down to four, five, six big blinds, you guys have 20, 25 big blinds each. Like, if I had king-queen the guy showed me king-jack, but it was for my tournament life, like, I would probably just fold. Because, like, you're going to be giving up, like, the double up in chips isn't worth the amount of money gained um, where compared to you losing and busting and the difference between what your chips are worth and sixth place money. Right. Because so that's the difference like, between sixth place money and fourth place money right. is a or huge third difference. Place money is a huge chunk, whereas your ICM amount of money your chips are worth with a double up is not worth that difference. So like that's like the kind of fine-tuned math. And this is one of those things where like, all poker players aren't super equipped with like these math formulas in their head. You know, it's kind of like an estimation guessing game. You you can't just go and just calculate your ICM and be like, right. Eh, yeah, this is a clear fault. Like you can't do with pot odds. You can't just take 30 seconds and calculate it out. And most poker players, they don't have, they're not a calculator when it comes to this, but you need to understand the implications when you're on both sides of the coin. Because if you are a chip leader in this spot, you can now put, an enormous amount of pressure on the three and four, the middle of the chip packs, because they don't want to bust um, sixth or fifth because of these low stacks. These short stacks, so, yeah. So now all of a sudden you can be pounding, 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 and they're like, ah, man, I got queens here, six-handed. This would never be a fold in the cash game. I would fist pump go all in in the cash game. If this was seven hours ago and there was still rebuys in this tournament, I couldn't be happier texting my buddy that I'm getting in with Queens here against the maniac chip leader. But in this spot, you might just be like, man, Queens, like this sucks. I don't want to have him come up with ace king and have to race for all my stack. I might just muck it because that's the, how much ICM pressure there is on that person. And now this is all assuming the chip leader assumes that these guys understand what ICM is because there's nothing worse than like thinking that a player is a thinking player that is very um, aware of these ICM pressures. And then him just be like, I'm in there. I got nines. Let's go. And you're like, Oh man, I got eight, seven suited, you know? So you have to be aware of like your players and that they are understanding of what's going on. Right. And you know, so it's, I mean, really ICM just comes down to, you you don't want to be second in chips in the tournament and clash with the chip leader and lose a huge pot. And, and that's the there. simplest way to put it, right? That, you that's, never that's see an ICM in a, disaster. a six-handed final table. You got two clear chip leaders and a bunch of short stacks. You very rarely see the number one, number two chip stacks go at it for big pots because of the fact that it's like it's just ICM suicide. What are you doing? Like you could just punt around here for a little bit and get third place money, no problem. Why the heck would you want to risk getting sixth place money? I mean, your chips are worth so much more, even though like, granted, I, I'm a, you know, 70% chance. Of- yeah. It's just like, again, I don't, I don't think that goes down the line of people going, well, I want to win the tournament. I want to do everything to that I can to win the tournament. And that's absolutely what you want to do. However, it's the smart play. It's the hedging of bets to make sure that you in the long run, it's a more profitable play to fold in that scenario or let the big stack get away with pushing a little bit more because maybe he's crazy. Maybe he doesn't know that this is a, you know, ICM suicide. Maybe he has no idea. He could be the the 30% dog and you still don't want to get involved because of the fact that it's like, why would I want to get knocked out now? When- yeah, so I, I, I that's pretty much you hit it on the head. You don't want... um. Uh, the best way I think is you don't want to get into these pots with these. Uh, I'm just trying to have, it's tough to describe without like paper and numbers and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, Which we don't have. I'm having, I'm having, yeah, we don't have that kind of stuff in front of people. I'm having a brain fart. Come back to me. 
Um, There's only two people on this podcast, Brandon. Yeah, we can't, we'll you can't back, just you know, say pass and like, I'm going to go pass, to like, pass, and now pass. we have our guest speaker, Phil. Phil, are you still <laughs> on the line? No, like there's no Phil. Like, you can't like pass to the next guy. Oh, but, I got it. So I got oh, it. Good. So, like, you're back. I got it. So, you know, if you're a chip leader and you, you come up with this pretty good spot to like, you know, maybe play a huge pot against second and chips and increase your chip lead exponentially and give yourself, let's just say 90% chance to win the tournament. Well, you may, you're, but then if you lose, you're out in sixth or you're really crippled and you're probably going to get sixth place because the second place guy, you guys are pretty much even, you know, so you don't, you never, ever, ever want to get sixth place in this tournament. So even though this spot might be good for you to double up or knock out second place and win the tournament, you can just find a better spot when there's three players left, right? Like you, you can win the tournament later when you have more locked up at the bottom. That's the conservative, smart way to play. Like, don't go for the win with six and then potentially be out in six. Like, go for the win with three when you got third place money locked up. And now, sure, your odds now aren't going to be 90% when you win the pot. They might be 60 or 70, but you now have all that extra money of sixth place, fifth place, fourth place that you've already locked up right. to make up the difference in that 90 to 60, which I know is this is what I was trying to spit out. It's tough visually. And like, again, we're just throwing out arbitrary numbers here and we're not calculators, but you just need to be aware of the situation that when you are short stack and you are sixth place, your chips are worth barely over sixth place money. So like you are at very, you're very much, you're not taking much risk at all when you go all in because you're supposed to get six. If sixth place is a thousand dollars, your sixth place chip stack might be worth 1100, 1200. Thirteen hundred dollars. So you know you're you're all in. There's no ICM pressure on you because you're right. supposed to get out next, and you're only risking two hundred, three hundred theoretical dollars. So take that spot, try and double up. Because now here, when you double up in your third, well now you even you doubled up, but your chips more than your chips to dollar ratio more than doubled up. Correct. If your short stack is worth twelve hundred, you double up. It's not worth twenty four hundred now. It might be worth four thousand. Hmm. And so that's why when you're sixth in chips, you know, you can say the opposite of these guys that have ICM pressure that, you know, chips earned are worth more than chips lost because you're gaining equity by doubling up more than double where these guys at the top are losing much more dollars than they are than they are gaining chips. Right. And the whole the whole dynamic of the table changes. Oh, it's massive. So another one thing that we've able to discuss is chip leaders. Let's let's fast forward to. um Forehanded. Let's just say we're down to forehanded, and it's like a, a chip leader that has 70% of the chips, and the other guys have 10%. You know, because that, that's just nice, easy math. 100% of the chips, 70, 10, 10, 10, four people left. The chip leader is incentivized to keep it forehanded because of ICM pressure, because those fourth, third, and seconds are fighting to get second, not fourth. So hard that you can just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate and you want it to last as long as possible forehanded because you can just suck up all the chips because they're honestly, they're not playing for a second, but a second would be a win in the current situation that they are at. Right. So they're, they're all three, basically they have 10, 10, 10%, 10%, 10%. They're all on average going to get third place money. Cause you know, we got second, third, fourth, you average them. You got there. So each of them is trying not to get fourth cause that's a loss. And to get second, which is a win in their current situation. So the chip leader can just, they love it when, you know, not they don't love it when they double them up, but when a guy ships on them and they fold, like it's no biggie. Like we're going to play another hand and I might win more chips because they shipped on me. And like, so just know that like keeping it four or five handed when you're a massive chip leader it is to your advantage. And that's kind of backwards thinking because you're like, why to be, I want there to be no players left but me. But this is just a way for you to suck up more chips and get such a huge advantage that the guys aren't even playing for first anymore. They're happy with second place. Which is why in a couple times in CCG, I've seen four people left and they go, we're going to give the guy first with the chip leader and then we're going to play. We're just going to chop second, third and fourth money up together. Which always blows my mind that anybody would want to take a deal like that. But I guess in all honesty, if you got one guy with... 70% of chips in play and you each have 10%, you're right. The idea of getting fourth 
and you really want to get third, and it would be a super win to get second, it's like, uh, I'm kind of willing to take my, you know, almost between second and third place money by chopping it, for, you know, giving him first place and then the rest of them splitting second, third, and fourth. I mean, they average out a little bit more money than... Uh, True, but that's assuming that these chip, that's assuming that these short stacks never get first. So, they're, right. you know, they're, they're giving up the, the equity on top. They're giving up the, the actual money equity because giving a guy first place with four handed left is crazy town in, in theory, like in straight dollars and cents. It's but they're willing to, you know, give themselves insurance and say, well, I get this pay pay jump from fourth to third, which in the spot I'm in right now would be a break even. Would I'd be I'm upset with fourth. I'm break even with third. I'm happy with second. And I'm ecstatic if I ever can come all the way back and win. They're going to just take the win out, and they're going to say, "Well, I'm not going to get second. I'll, I'll, I'm happy with our third place money, all three of us." And they just they hedge out. It's basically just a hedge. They're now, saying, it, I'm willing. I'm willing to. I'm willing to leave with a little bit more instead of gambling here with right. four big blinds. Now, is there whoever. any way to use this information to your advantage? Obviously, everybody. We've gone over how to use it to your advantage when you're the big stack, when you're the chip leader of the tournament. How do you use this to your advantage when you're one of the middle stacks? And even well, so the small stacks, we're kind of going with the idea of you've got four to five big blinds. You're on live support. You're looking for a hand, and it's not even a great hand. You're just looking for a face card maybe even a, whatever. You're just looking for something that may or may not work. And it really kind of depends on where you're at in the blinds. Sometimes it's like, I got four big blinds left and I'm coming with the big blind. Well, this, this is it. And right. ma- maybe the hand before you've got there. King five and you're like, ah, shit, I, my, my big blind might not be as good as King five. So rip it. I'm in uh, at this point. I have no choice. I'm literally down to my last. Do I want to go with King high or do I want to just take my chances with two random cards when I'm forced to be the big blind next. Plus, right. so, ahead, you might get a little bit of fold equity. Not a ton, but maybe a little bit. You might get a guy with a king 10 or 7 to fold out because you did it right. on the button. Or, you know, you did it earlier than you were supposed to. But anyways, sorry, that's just... You, have, you, have, so you have some fold equity. Uh, just, I mean, say. again, a minuscule amount. But there is just that little little bit of doubt, which is important. So, again, sometimes you'll see those short stacks. You, you got to rip a king 5 or a or Jack Deuce as uh, Stacia would do, because just like, eh, yeah, uh, I'm got, in there. I'm in there. Um, so yeah, how does so the middle? Is, how does the middle yeah. guy? How does the middle guy work this to his advantage? How do you try to reverse some of these pressure situations where you can pick up some extra money by playing a middle stack better? So this is going right in line with our previous episode. Okay. Because there's no ICM pressure on the bottom, and there's you you know how to play the you know how to play the big stack. You know how to play the big stack on a bubble. It's the same exact thing on ICM. And the, the small stacks, you play tight, you wait for a hand. There is no ICM pressure. You know, these small guys, there's no pressure because... All the pressure's on the middle up. stacks. The, so the middle stacks, it's, you know, it's where we get this dividing road that we mentioned last episode. You can try and be the one that applies the ICM pressure on the other middle stacks because they should be aware of it and folding out much more. But that is the same double-edged sword where you end up committing an ICM disaster when the other guy doesn't fold out when he's supposed to or the other guy picks up a huge hand. You have now just committed an ICM suicide because you got sixth when you were just trying to push the fourth-place chips off of a huge hand because he's got to fold. Or he's supposed to fold. He's supposed to fold. But A, he picks up aces or kings. Or B, he doesn't really realize what's going on, and he's got ace jack suited, and it's a clear fold from ICM standards, but he has no idea, and he's in there. You lose a race, you lose a sixty forty, you lose whatever, and now all of a sudden you have committed a disaster, and you've gotten sixth when you have fourth and chips, and there's two shorties. So the middle is kind of it's a gray area. I don't even know if I know. I don't even know. It's tough because you're going to be you're, there's pressure all over the place. There's pressure from the top. There's pressure from the side. There's obviously no pressure from the guys who have no pressure, but those guys can hurt you too. You don't just want to give them a courtesy double because now all of a sudden you turn into the short stack. Right. So the middle is is the very it's the hardest. It's the hardest to play probably on the bubble too. You have to decide which way you're going to go and you know take that path. Here, I really don't have any answers. I mean, it's really probably. It's, it's very much final table dependent. It has very much to do with how much blinds you have. Is your middle stack 
eight big blinds or is your middle stack 25 big blinds? Right. Because if your middle stack's eight big blinds, I'm just going to play super tight because if I'm in the middle and have eight big blinds, that means these shorties have four, three, two big blinds. I'll let the chip leaders try and knock them out. Whereas if the middles have 25 big blinds and the shorties have, you know, 10, 12, I was going to say seven, eight. Now yeah. they are able to kind of every, everything kind of slows down a little bit. So it's just, it, it is, you got to be aware of, and it's hard to do that in the tournament itself because you're getting hands so fast. And that's the other thing that happens. The game speeds up oh, yeah. no matter what Stack happens. Cause chips. there's just every, it's like, good God, I haven't even fixed my chip stacks. The waitress came over. I can't do anything. It's like, man, hand, 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 hand. I, you feel that, that stress from just, you don't get any chance to, and every, typically a lot of the hands I find at a final table, there's a lot of pre-flop, right? Like it's, everybody's trying to finagle their way to either get a fold pre-flop. Not many people are seeing flops. And then well, you're not, yeah, right. You're not taking too many flops because mm-hmm. the blinds are so small. You don't really, you don't really, it doesn't, um, doesn't fit well for doesn't flops happen. to even show up. A lot of like final table flop, play is just all, all pre-flop, right. right? Or an all in and a fold. Right. Three bet, all in, full, 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 full. Okay, next hand. It's like, Jesus, I didn't even get a chance to. I always love the people that have to go pee, and they're like, can we get a break? Can we get a break? You're like, guys, the, the breaks are scheduled. We're not just going to randomly take a break. It's not fair. Like, it is it is what it is. And then you get the guy who's like, looks at his button, rip runs to the bathroom, <laughs> like, bolt, get out of my way, get out of my way, <laughs> tries to go pee, comes flying back. He's like, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, you know, to try to get the dealer to acknowledge the fact that they're, I'm air quoting now, within sight of their seat right, so that their hand right, doesn't get folded. It's just the funniest thing. Um I don't know. Is it something about poker players that everybody believes that if they get up and use the restroom or get up to go do whatever it is and they miss a hand, that's always going to be the hand that they have aces or kings on? Yep. That's just, yeah, they don't, they don't want to miss a hand. I mean, dude, it's just as likely, it's evenly as likely that you get the hand that you would have busted on. Right. As you do, you get the hand that you double up on. You just never know. It's the whole, uh, you know, Forrest Gump syndrome is is uh life's like a box of chocolates or you know everybody's fate is predetermined like fate already knew you were going to go to the bathroom at that time so there's zero chance you're going to get a good hand or bust or it just it was never going to happen you were always going to leave at that particular moment or maybe Forrest Gump's mom is right and you know you just open that box of chocolates and see what you get and hope for the best um speaking of going to the bathroom how, how much time do we have left you're 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 the time master yeah we're at like 32 minutes all right so we got I got a quick Three minutes I mean, should we put out right? a warning system here of like this is a Brandon bathroom story or it, it is a Brandon bathroom okay. story. You have been um, forewarned, folks, if you are not into bathroom stories. Thanks for listening to episode twelve. For the rest of you into Brandon's bathroom time, please hang on for our bonus episode. All right. So sixteen hundred and fifty dollar HPT. Ooh. Day two. In the money. Dinner break day two. Twenty players left. Okay. 20 players left on three tables. 260K for first. Wow. Um, I am a shorty. I'm a shorty. I'm like probably, I would say, 15th in chips with 20 left. Um, we're on dinner break. Um, Serene's still in. White Sox Brian's still in. I'm all in the down in the dumps. Like, man, I just punted off a double. Or I, you know, I called off with Ace Queen, and I thought the old guy had Ace King, and he did, and I lost. And I'm down to 12 big blinds. So we go to dinner. This is at the Ameristar in um, East Chicago. They're, they just opened a new sports bar there. I get this, like, huge, massive, like, double-pound burger, bacon, blah, 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 fries. I mean, it's nice. probably one of the biggest burgers I've ever had. Pre-keto, and, obviously. And I'm just, yeah, pre-keto. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, I eat this thing, and I'm like, dude, why did I do that? I'm at the final 20 playing for literally over $200,000 and I just feel God awful. Right. Like if this was Thanksgiving, this is the time where you flip on football and you take a two hour nap and then <laughs> you turn on the Detroit it, game and you just fall asleep. And instead I'm going back up to battle my way out in like where you should be the mentally sharpest where, you know, the, the pros have eaten like, a cantaloupe, a grape, and an avocado toast. And like, and they're drinking, they're like 
room temperature Fiji water. Right. Well, I'm just like slugging the Diet Pepsi. Oh, for sure. Like, I got this pound burger. This is longer than three. It reminds okay. me. It reminds me of that scene in uh, that scene in Kingpin, where like he's walk. Woody Harrelson's walking into like the Vegas at the end of the movie, and like they're eating pizza, they're smoking, they're like, dude, yep. like that's like yep. how I envision a poker tournament is. But like, yep. really good hardcore tournament players, they're like, got to get my my electrolytes up. They drink a little right. bit of Gatorade, war- room temperature water. They do some stretches like, I at think break. Of backpack Dan. I think a backpack Dan. Where oh, he yeah. always brought like the salads and like his wife cut up nice fruit salads for him. And like, it was just, I mean, that's just, you know, it's not, that's great. I mean, you so Brandon goes you full suck. opposite, basically. Um, yep. And so- I'm in full depressed mode. Like I'm going to boss and right. white Sox friends. Like, dude, you're on the dinner break of day two. Like, get it together here kid. Right. like you know what i mean like be happy what like, are you doing right i got like seven thousand locked up and i'm all upset so get back to the table shit you not um double up twice king queen of clubs against ace queen i flop a flush draw river a club double two hands later queens against jacks hold so now i've spun 13 to 26 26 to like it might have been like 8 to 16, 16 to 32. Right. I'm middle of the pack now. I'm pumped. Heart's blasting. You know, I'm just like, wow, I can't believe. Like, I can just sit around here and make the final table. And, like, making the HPT final table is it's pretty huge. I mean, you're Absolutely. on the stream. And now, like, you know, it's, I'm into the money for, like, 8,000. Final table, min cash, ninth place was, like, 15K. And this was three years ago. 15K would have, like, you know, doubled or tripled my bankroll. Right. Like, it, this is now... I mean, obviously, 250K is life-changing money, but, like, top seven is life-changing money for me. Right. Um, So, adrenaline's pumping, and all of a sudden, my stomach is just rumbling. Rumbling, rumbling, like, rumbling like you would not believe. And so, now I'm just like, well, shit, I, it's, it's like 15 or 14 left, and I'm at a seven-handed table. I'm trying to time out. Like, I'm like, I got to go to the bathroom. Like, I just, I got to go. Like, I, I don't even know if I have to, like... I don't even know what I have to do. I just know I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, it's, I got to get out of here. Right. I got to get out of here. So I'm like, well, I don't, I don't want to do it when my blinds are coming up because I don't want to miss my blinds, but I don't want to like do it around the button area because that's like the prime position. So I do it when I'm like middle position and I run to the bathroom and I don't know how graphic you want to get here, but I just, I just made myself throw up. I was like, I got, like, I just, like, oh, was, I was thinking it was going to no, come out the other no, end. No, you were, no, yeah, no. just some butterflies and some things were happening. And yeah, yes, you just, but it was, it, yeah. And I mean, and then this, you know, without getting too graphic, my whole entire meal that I scarfed down for four that just I came myself, right back up, all came Ugh. right back up. And I mean, I went like just full blown, you know, fingers down the throat, boom, 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 boom. There was somebody else in the bathroom. <laughs> I was just like, so now I come out like, I got a little bit around my mouth. Like I'm sweating. I'm all red and flustered. I just like splash some, some, um, splash some cold water on my face, wipe my face down, wash my hands. And I'm just, I'm, I'm back in there now. I mean, we're talking about, I was in the bathroom for two minutes maximum and a lot happened in that two minutes. So now I, I get back to the table and I'm under the gun. And I, so I'm like, Oh, I made it back in time. Like, let's go. I'm so pumped. I made it back in time. I look down at Jack nine of diamonds and I'm so just flustered and, you know, not in it and not like realizing what's going on here. And I just, I'm like, eh, I raise it up. So I just get back and I'm like tilted and I just raise up the Jack nine of diamonds folds all the way around to the big blind. The big blind min clicks it back to me, min three bets back. I'm like, well, it's Jack nine of diamonds. I'm calling here. I call it's an ace high board, all three diamonds. So I flop a jack high flush, like third nuts. King high flush beats me, queen high flush beats me, and that's it. But it's an ace high board. And the dude leads out, and I raise, and he goes all in, and I snap call, and he has pocket aces for a set of aces, and it runs out like 4 4, and I get out of the tournament. No. For like a second and chip or third, like top three chip stack. I rushed back in, and I'm talking. I got, I was sat down and raised Jack nine suited three seconds after I sat down. So like, I just got there back in time enough to get it in real good with, I mean, the equities on that, it's probably like a $50,000 hand. That guy went on to win the tournament. Uh, wow. Gary, Gary went on to win the tournament. Oh, nice. And, and, um, for 256 K and I busted 14 all because two things happened. I was kind of upset because a, I think I never, if I never, 
ate that burger or felt crappy or had to go to the bathroom, I just would have mocked Jack Nine suited. You know, because it's under the gun. You're just you're mucking that. It's a tournament. Right. That's a, it's an easy decision muck. But because I came back and was flustered and I was upset, I missed three hands and I was wasn't feeling great. I opened it up, and so that's just kind of going along with the lines of sometimes you're going to make it back in time and it's going to cost you your tournament. It's not always going to be. So if I just would have stayed in the bathroom. 20 seconds longer, I would have made it for my big blind, would have folded the jack nine, and who knows? I mean, who knows what would have happened then? But um, just a little story of I really don't always that run for, back, I, let your hands I, go through. Sometimes you rush back to only get busted from the tournament. Yep. And I blame that burger for my 14th place because I, I was, I mean, I had, I was fifth, sixth, or seventh in chips, could have glided to the final table. Kind of committed some ICM death watch there. Yes, it happens. Even though it was a good spot, and if I could do it again, I'm not really sure what I would do. Nice. It's one of those you'd have to plug that into a calculator. See what I your odds up, were. I gave up thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, but I was like 72 percent or whatever, you know. And then he misses on the turn, and all of a sudden I'm like, I'm 80 percent. This is well, great. I know I'm going to double up. I know maybe your intent on the story was the the bathroom portion of it, but I think ultimately this this screams what ICM the decisions that you make and how your chips are worth real money and it's very difficult at times in a tournament to think about the actual chips each one having an individual dollar amount assigned to them cuz yep. like you said if you'd have folded there you probably would have made the final table and gotten you know you know a top 15,000 to 200,000 instead of 7,000 correct so i mean even just say final table and you brick out there and get ninth place 10th place whatever it is and you get the 15k i mean you gave up $8,000 because of that 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 and again you're a 70% favorite but you gave up so much money i mean it's not the 8,000 it's the 8,000 plus all of that potential money that you gave up that if you just would have coasted for a little bit you probably easily could have gotten into Seventh, right. eighth place, eight, eight, yeah, which is now twenty. Playing super tight, super knit, super you know top range poker here, and have been fine. But right where where my double up where where I double up, yes, I would have been third in chips and could have now much easier or easier easier attained first, second, third, and fourth. Like it still might not have been worth it. Might not even have been at worth seventy percent. I mean, as it turns out, it wasn't worth it because you you lost, but. Even if you take that exact scenario, hey, I have a 70% chance to win or bust and lose minimum 8K, you lost $8,000 in that hand. Um, Easy, yeah. Easily, minimum, you lost 8000 It's like, does the potential of where you're going to be at in the tournament go? I mean, granted, it's nice that Gary ended up going on to win that tournament, but you never know how the cards would have played out at that point. But it's interesting. Oh, sure, ICM yeah. is a it very, is. like... I find it to be kind of it's next level thinking. And on top of that, it's like such a weird, like hypothetical, like, is it worth it? Well, I'm a 70% chance favorite. Why would I ever not take that bet? Well, the reason is, is what we just stated that you lost. And this is where you need like an actual calculator, but there Correct. is math behind it. You can search like ICM like examples and um, it'll, it'll give you the exact math of here's the chips you're giving up that are worth this amount of money. And now if you win, you now have this, you have this equity worth this amount of money. Right. So is it worth that risk? Well, cool. I, I love it. Um, ICM, yeah. what is it? How to play it and what to do with it. Um, and even like me, I have a great understanding of ICM, but I still I don't I don't know every decision. Correct. It's still a it's still kind of a you're still nervous about the decisions that you made and if it if it's the right one using these new factors. But yes. that's going to wrap it up for episode 12 of the Over the uh, Poker Podcast. Thank you for listening again. As always, guys, please leave us a review. Um, all reviews are welcome. I know we always joke and say, please only leave us five-star reviews. And, and we really want you to leave a five-star review. But follow us on Twitter at the overlay underscore pod. Please do not spell out underscore because I did get an email from somebody who's like, <laughs> why did I? And like, that's not right. Um, it's just a little underscore, you know, character. Uh, also subscribe and, and you know, share with your friends, even your non-poker player friends. Just, hey, l- right. listen to these two ding I like to think we entertain. We are we entertaining. Entertain all genres. Anything. Top, top five podcast of all time. Wow, that's strong. I yeah. like it. I mean, at this point, 45 minutes in, how many people are really not thinking this is a top five podcast. I figure anybody listens to us for 45 minutes, <laughs> like my mom thinks this is a top five podcast. That's so great. That is the most logical thing you've said today. Yep. Pretty good. ICM right there, folks. Well, thank you for listening. We will catch you next time. Brandon, 
Anything uh, you no, want to finish off I mean, I really like my Welcome Back America because I really do. I am pleased that we are trying to get back to some sort of normalcy here. God bless so, America. I want to get back I to like, normal. I like something yeah. closer to normal than what we're currently at. Yes. All right, everybody. We'll see you next time. Episode 13. Ooh, scary. Bye. <laughs>